All right, I'm going to ask our speakers if they would join me up here. Thank you for submitting questions. As always, we get more questions than we can possibly ask. Um, there's sometimes some overlap. Uh, sometimes it's a, a good and fair question. We would just say uh, that may not be useful for as many people. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll sort of table those kind of questions. Um, and again, the biggest thing is just the, the, the amount of time we have uh, with these gentlemen. Uh, have you been served and are you thankful for their work among us this weekend? I am. Yeah, I've been blessed and encouraged and heartened in the Lord uh, to again see these connections in the Bible and uh, to see the Christ of the Bible. So thank you for your time preparing these talks and, of course, teaching us uh, throughout a pretty jam-packed weekend. Um, let me start with this. We'll play a couple of games. Here's a fill-in-the-blank game. Uh, the Bible is blank. Give us a word and then just maybe a couple of sentences. So this is going to be like a word picture thing. Your favorite ways of talking about this kind of thing that we're talking about this weekend regarding the Bible. You know, the Bible is yeah. puzzle pieces. Yeah, I already like, used one for Yeah, like a bit. puzzle. So we used that yeah. one in the first talk, and we, we think of how the Bible comes to us in 66 books and however many characters and places, and it's just out of hand how many details there are there. And yet, like a puzzle with a bunch of pieces, they all fit together. And it's not like a mosaic, like we said, where you make what you want out of it. They didn't come from various places. They really came from one place, one author. Uh, God, inspired by his spirit. And so we know that if we give ourselves to it, it will yield itself to us. It will make itself, it will reveal itself to us. It does go together. And with time, we can be encouraged that we can know the Lord better through it. So a puzzle. The Bible is like, from the blank. Oh, you want like or something, eh? <laughs> I would say the Bible is God's love letter to us, right? Okay, that's good. <laughs> but, I mean, in terms of the larger issue, I mean, the Bible, I think, is like a grand mystery novel right? mm -hmm. uh, that unfolds uh, chapter by chapter in some sense across time uh, where all of it's going yet you need all the parts to contribute to that so that's another image of it okay another one Trent <laughs> yeah it's not like grass so it endures forever <laughs> it endures forever you know it's more like a rock uh, God's given it to us it is an inspired word every word it's his, and we can trust it. It doesn't move, even as we do. I knew this question would be right up your alley, so I, I'll actually pull the string roll back right now and, okay. and uh, keep you from continuing with other okay. metaphors and examples that I, <laughs> that I know are just bubbling and spinning in your brain right now. I'm actually out, but... <laughs> <laughs> so why are these historical, structural, connective issues important? Um, someone wrote in... How does this make me love God more? I want to take some time on that kind of question, especially up front before we continue through the rest of the Q&A on those detailed kind of questions. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I would say, um, why is <laughs> the structure and how the Bible's put together uh, important, right? Because uh, we want to be faithful to how God has given it to us, right? So if we don't read scripture the way I want to say God intends for it to be read not just you know our imaginations putting it together but if God has revealed he's he's acted in history this way his word is given at, through his redemptive work that we will inevitably uh, draw wrong conclusions or not get everything right and so how does that tie into love of God? Well, I mean, we are to love the Lord our God who has made us, who has redeemed us with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We know him from his word. So if we don't get his word right and we're drawing f wrong conclusions or not fully getting it, we're not fully loving him and serving him and our Christian lives will be uh, eventually affected by that. I mean, we grow by his word. We know him by his word not a word that we make up or read it in the way we want to. Uh, we are always in danger of uh, taking Scripture and putting it in our own understanding. Right? So we want to 
make sure we are following what God has said and understand how it is given to us so that we rightly know him? Yeah, two passages come to mind. So I think of uh, Luke 24, which we've spent some time in, where on the road to Emmaus, Jesus appears, but he's not known to be Jesus to them, and explains uh, all of Scripture to them in light of himself. And it says, their hearts burned within them. And as Jesus explained the Scriptures to them, interpreting for them all of the things in Scripture concerning himself, their hearts burned within them, not knowing it was Jesus talking to them, which is to say that their affections were aroused and their love for Jesus was inflamed. Their hearts burned for him precisely by seeing him on the pages of Scripture. So one answer is, apparently in God's wisdom, we need the book. Apparently we need the book. He could have given us a five-page summary of the situation. But apparently we need the narrative. And how glad I am that they didn't shorten Lord of the Rings to like a 15-minute commercial. It's because of the terrain and the depth of the story and the themes that reveal things. Never trade that nine-hour uh, three-part for anything. So it's like that. Apparently in God's wisdom, we need a good long story. We need a detailed story. And the Bible has a lot of layers because our sin has a lot of layers and our solution has a lot of layers. And God himself is great. Yeah. So. I think of 1 Peter 1. These are things that angels longed yeah. to look into and prophets searched diligently to try to understand the who and the when and the what manner of the Christ who was to come. Yeah. Um, so we should probably respect angels yeah. and prophets yeah. and follow their lead. Yeah, and, 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 it's a, and it's a sobering reality to realize that people can have the Bible, read the Bible, and not understand the Bible, right? I mean, so we have examples in Scripture itself, the Judaizers. Paul's argument against them is you don't understand how the Bible's put together. I mean, and there's other issues as well, but uh, you have the, the Jewish leaders, right? They're not understanding who the Messiah is standing right before them. They're reading the Old Testament. They're not understanding it. So it's crucial that we rightly handle the word of truth. And yet we would also admit that there is the possibility that you can get from 2 Samuel 7 to somewhere good in the New Testament and see Jesus' connections and yet not love him, maybe mm -hmm. not no, even absolutely. be saved. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's not, it's not simply Bible discovery right. as an end in itself. We want to know God, mm -hmm. and this is how the God of the Bible has mm -hmm. revealed himself. Mm -hmm. And as we talk about the Bible's intricacy and why we have such a long book, it's good to remember that its message is ultimately straightforward and simple. A message about God, our sin and need and his mm -hmm. salvation so that children can come to Jesus and he welcomes them. So that men can hear, men and women can hear the message of the gospel and repent and believe and be baptized in the book of Acts as we see. So it's simple, but there's depth. So you uh, basically just a minute ago already started to answer this question, Trent. Um, but I want you to circle back to it. Why did God take so long Right, so if we've got the first <laughs> gospel promise in Genesis 3.15, mm -hmm. and we've got all these covenants and promises that come after, all these characters and stories and developments and ups and downs, why did God take so long to bring Messiah? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, so without the, <laughs> without the Noah story, you're, you're, the Noah story reveals something to us about the gravity of the problem, the extent of the problem to every thought and intent and all that it would bring in terms of judgment. And then the, the Mosaic Covenant, for all you worked through the Mosaic Covenant earlier today, all the, all the real estate in our Bible that that covers, the story of Israel is a story re reinforcing a very simple point, and that is that the Lord must save. So that by the time Jesus comes, it is straightforward that this is precisely the kind of Savior we need. We need a divine human son of David, son of Abraham, son of Eve, to come and to die in our place. And without the broader story, we just cannot fathom or comprehend all that's taking place on the cross. And so, you know, we've got a, we don't have a terribly long to live, but we've got plenty of Sundays and sermons, and the Lord gives us teachers, and that helps us to put things together. And um, I like to think of the Bible in its complexity, which can be intimidating, as more like um, an adventure so, and it's something to explore that never stops giving you treasure.
treasure. You just keep searching out the treasure that is the Lord Jesus uh, and his salvation. Anything yeah. to add, Steve? I'm I, know, I, I mean, I think, I mean, ultimately, the, the answer is uh, we don't know fully in terms of God's purposes why he took so long. Uh, part of it, I mean, is to set up so that we do understand. We're pretty dull. So we need to have repetition over and over again. Um, but I, I, I think in the big scheme of things, uh, in some sense, we think it's long. I'm not sure God thinks it's long. Right? I mean, the God who's existed from all eternity, uh, what we have now experienced, even in terms of creation to us, is probably a blip in the screen. So, I mean, so we're looking at it in some sense of, uh, oh, uh, this seems long to us because we're looking at it in terms of our own life. But our, our lives are just simply a, a, a vapor, right? Yeah. So from eternity to eternity, uh, it'll probably seem, well, it wasn't that long. <laughs> but you know, over time, God does work through history, and he does work. Uh, it builds confidence and trust. And part of, uh, I mean, I'm sure, the, the waiting for the coming of Messiah, I mean, even from you know, Isaiah 700 years or so, uh, is to build I will trust the Lord, I'll walk by faith. I mean, so all that is, is, is part of it as well. And we're in a season of waiting again. Yep, exactly right. right. Uh, imagine yeah. if it all happened very fast and then 2,000 years yeah. of waiting for, second, for the second coming yeah. was what we experienced. We wouldn't have the experience of those waiting saints of old. Well, and we also have to also tie it to, uh, you know, God has a people, right? And those people have to be born. And those, yeah. so, so that's happened. So if it happened, uh, you know, Messiah, you know, Christ comes uh, by Noah's time, uh, you and I wouldn't be here. <laughs> so he has uh, a people from eternity. He's going to bring about their salvation. And that happens over a period of time. Great. So this weekend, we're, we've been considering uh, from a number of angles, <clears throat> how the chronology of the Bible is important, what came first and where it's going and, and that sort of thing. Uh, if chronology is so important, how come our Bibles aren't laid out in a strictly chronological way? You can actually buy a, yeah. chrono a chronology Bible. I believe it's called that, right? A one-year chronology yep, Bible. Yep, yep, yep. Um, it, it, there's general chronology. Genesis is much earlier than Revelation. but. Uh, Steve, why are our Bibles late? Yeah, that's, like that's a very, yeah, very, very important question because uh, you know sometimes if you push the chronology so much, then you have people creating all this chronology Bible. That's not, I think, uh, what we want to to communicate. What we're trying to communicate, and I think this is true to the Bible itself, uh, is that God has worked from creation to through the Old Testament to Christ to the New Creation. So there is tied to history. So there's chronology. But there's also insertions of books together, right? So do you think of the, the writings, the wisdom literature? I mean, it, it, it's, it's debatable, you know, when, when Job is written, right? I mean, there's a lot of people think that uh, Job is very, very early, but it's put as a collection for a certain purpose. So you don't want to now start taking Job out, putting it back in Genesis. So uh, what's more significant, I think, is the basic shape of the Bible does follow chronology. So, you know, we have the Pentateuch, first five books. So you start with creation that works through uh, the overall history. And then you've got Joshua and Judges. And then the former prophets cover that basic history, but chronicles, recycles around and so on. Uh, the New Testament authors, as they look back, they do, uh, they do appeal to this. Uh, Paul appeals to it in Romans 4, Galatians 3. The author of Hebrews constantly says, you've got to know where this passage was in the unfolding plan. But the chronology, I think, is tied, and I think we put it in the book there, is tied to uh, covenantal location. That's, that's more significant. So that uh, the wisdom literature is a body of literature, but it's located in terms of uh, Davidic themes, covenant, wisdom, tying back to creation. The prophets are post-Davidic. So you can combine some of them together. There are different historical places. So Ezekiel is not where uh, Isaiah is, yet uh, it's all post-Davidic. And it's that which I think is the uh, important thing in reading the Bible. Where are we in the story covenantally? Because the Old Covenant covers the entire from Exodus on. The Davidic Covenant overlaps with it. Uh, yet we are saying, what covenant are we under? Where are we in God's plan? How is it leading us to Christ? Right? Now, our shape of the Old Testament uh, canon basically follows that. Right? And uh, so it is a basic understanding of redemptive history. But I would not encourage 
uh, taking books out of their literary units. They're given to us by inspiration. The Pentateuch is a whole unit. The wisdom literature is put in the canon together. Uh, the minor prophets are written together. Keep that together. So don't go trying to divide it up into, you know, this was written here, this was written there. Uh, but think through the covenantal location. Okay. Anything to add on that, Trent? Nope, that sounds right. <laughs> yeah. 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 He gives you an A. That's me, I give you an A. <laughs> right. Right. But there is a lot of discussion on this, right? And uh, uh, you know, we had been talking earlier about um, our English Bibles. Uh, the ordering of the Old Testament really follows the Greek translation called the Septuagint. Uh, and most of the Old Testament ordering, the Jewish ordering, is different. It finishes with Chronicles. It goes from Genesis to Chronicles. And uh, I think we could make a strong case that that's probably the way we should read it that way. Um, because Chronicles sort of is a bookend to Genesis. Wouldn't you say that whether you're talking about the Jewish ordering or the Septuagint ordering, there was reason and rationale and sort of... Their, its own kind of interpretation of the placement of books to, to send a certain message, like Chronicles ending with right, this, right. you know, the hanging question of David's son and the fulfillment. Well, and, and also, you see, the, the Septuagint ordering followed much more of just sort of worship in, in, in meetings, that kind of ordering. But, but, you know, we often, I'm sure you, you, when you wonder, uh, you got Samuel, you got Kings, you got Chronicles, you say, boy, this is really getting overdone here, right? But, but... Chronicles is covering the same territory as Samuel and Kings, yet it's doing it from an entirely different perspective, after right? After the exile? It's, well, well, I think they're probably all after the exile, yet it is giving you, I would say, a theological, more of stepping out. So, for instance, in Chronicles, uh, there's uh, no mention of Bathsheba. Right? There's nothing really negative about David. Now, when you read Samuel... I mean, he cried, David, after Bathsheba, just goes, right? And uh, there's nothing really mentioned negative about Solomon. So you, so you say, well, what's going on here? Because Chronicles finishing the canon tied to the prophets is looking to the ideal David. So I think there's, a, there's so you, you lose, you could get that same message if you put it earlier, uh, just the way you read the book, but it's more clear if you put it near the end, right? So in that sense, uh, how the canon is ordered, but the basic covenantal shape, I think, is the most significant, yeah. Okay. I can't recall which one of you talked about this, but the, the, the issue of promises being conditional and mm, unconditional. No. Was it you, Steve? Well, I mean, we all... Yeah, we've, we've, why don't you yeah, we've talk about that for a little bit? Just yeah, to circle I'll, back and talk about yeah, it. Yeah, later. I'll kick it up, and then you can pick up or leave off. Um, so in the ancient Near East, there are a couple different kinds of covenants. You've got, it's called a royal grant covenant. That's um, an unconditional covenant, usually by equal parties. You've got a, what's called a suzerain vassal covenant. And this would be where there's a sort of a, a superior and an inferior. And those would be conditional. So the suzerain, if the superior could uh, embed conditions in the covenant, and uh, if it was broken by the inferior, so, so there's different types of covenants. And often, as we look at covenants in the Bible, folks have tried, and not for bad reasons, to say, is this this kind of covenant or is this that kind of covenant? It is, a, is it a, an unconditional covenant where promises are made that will be kept and that will not be broken? Or is it uh, a conditional covenant where the thing can be broken and canceled? The thing is, and we showed you in some of our talks and the Abrahamic's an example where God, I will, I will, I will, I will. I mean, it's just certain. And then there's all these conditional statements that are just sitting there that he's going to bless because of Abraham's obedience. So this is something I picked up from Dr. Wellen and his co-author in another book, Peter Gentry, and during seminary. And that is to acknowledge that there are, appear to be conditional and unconditional elements within the biblical covenants, and that's okay. The trick is to understand how those relate. So, uh, to rehearse a little bit of what I'd said in Abrahamic, God has made these promises, and he will fulfill them. And in that sense, they're unconditional, they're unilateral, they're going to happen. But the way that they come about is in connection with conditions obedience and faith, which creates tension in the Bible storyline so that now you have Abraham and his sons, Abraham and his offspring, 
promises that God will fulfill. He walked through the pieces, remember. He will fulfill them, and yet he said he requires obedience. And so we're looking then for how uh, will that obedience come about? Who will obey? And of course, what we end up needing, because humans always fail, is a divine human who comes and obeys perfectly, who is the greater Abraham, who is Abraham's seed, Jesus, perfect in faith and obedience, um, all the way to a cross. So that conditional, acknowledging in the Abrahamic covenant and his example, conditionality and unconditionality allows you to, creates tension in the story that is resolved when the coming of Christ. But you lose uh, if you don't acknowledge it, it would be helpful for me to hear you chat about it yeah, a bit, would yeah. be why someone would say a covenant is conditional or why they would say it's unconditional. Yeah. Maybe Abrahamic would be the good one to even tease it out. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's, it, this, the question of conditional, unconditional is, is hugely discussed and, and debated. And uh, uh, Trent's right that there is, in the ancient Near East, there is these patterns of covenants that tend, one tends to be more unconditional, the other one conditional. Um, yet you have to be very careful that you don't just then take ancient Near East and say, oh, and then put it on the Bible and say, well, this is this kind of covenant, that's that kind of covenant. Uh, often the, they're working within the same context, yet the Bible's often different as well. So it's often preserving the differences which are crucial. So as you look at the covenants, they do have within them always the demand for obedience, right? So that would be conditional. And uh, some, though, will try to say, well, no, Abrahamic, because of Genesis 15, is unconditional. The Davidic covenant, because God makes a promise to the king, regardless, it's unconditional. The new covenant is unconditional. Uh, the Mosaic, or old covenant, is conditional, because you have a lot of you know, curses, blessings, and so on. And it's a way of sort of getting at law-gospel distinctions as well, right? So without undermining law-gospel, I think we... Uh, as you look at the data, what is crucial to see is there's conditionality, unconditionality in all of them, but it all depends on how you put that together. The fear is, is that if you make the covenants conditional, it looks like you have works. It's not what you're trying to convey, right? What you're trying to do is start with creation. And this is, this is the point, and this is the tension that runs through the story, right? Is that God as creator, <laughs> he demands from us obedience perfect obedience, right? What else would he demand? He's the Lord and creator, right? So that right from the very beginning, Adam and the entire human race is to obey. That doesn't change at all throughout the Bible, right? You and I you know, deserve to give God perfect obedience. And of course, perfect obedience would be to love him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor is yourself, the great commandment. That doesn't happen. So even in uh, Abraham's demand for obedience, the nation of Israel's demand for obedience, David is demanded to obey. The tension comes is God forgives, he justifies, yet there is no perfect obedience. Right? That can't go on forever. There has to be one who comes and perfectly obeys. And of course, this is what then gets picked up in the New Testament. The obedience theme tied to the coming of Christ is everywhere. He comes to obey for us. He comes to pay for our sin. In the new covenant, we're still to obey God, but our, the grounding of our salvation is in Christ, his obedience, his work on the cross. But the covenants are leading you to and show you that that is what the demand is. God still holds out for us perfect obedience, but we find that in Christ. That's called the doctrine of justification. So the grounding to a proper understanding of justification the imputation of Christ's righteousness to us is a proper understanding. God always demands obedience. That's true of all the covenants. God must save. He, we can't save ourselves. That's the unconditional that runs through the entire Bible. Even the old covenant, it's grounded in God's promises to Abraham. It's God, grounded in God's promises, Genesis 3.15. And as it works itself out, it doesn't lead to us work salvation. It's Christ and Christ alone. And I do think that makes sense of the biblical covenants. Even in Isaiah, there's a very, very important passage in Isaiah 55, verse 3, where it's a promise of the new covenant, and it speaks of the new covenant grounded. Our English translations aren't the best here, so if you look it up, you probably won't see what I'm going to say here. But uh, in a larger book, Kingdom Through Covenant, uh, my colleague and I wrote a uh, long discussion of this. It talks about the new covenant grounded in the performance 
of David. Now, that's not historic David. That's ultimately in the obedience of the messianic David, right? And Christ comes, think of Philippians 2, right? Christ comes, he's the son of God who takes on our humanity, and what's he do? He obeys. He obeys even to death on a cross. He comes under the law to obey. The only hope for us is that we have an obedient redeemer who can act on our behalf. And that's how I think the covenants work. That preserves the gospel message. That makes sense of, uh, you know, the plan of salvation and why Christ alone is Lord and Savior. And uh, you can make gospel sense of it in other ways, but I think this is how the Bible works and so, yeah. Let's talk about uh, individual Old Testament stories and how most people probably tend to interpret and apply them. Um, probably most of us, if we grew up in church, we went to a Sunday school where here in this story, David is good, therefore be like David and be good. And here in this story, Saul is bad, therefore don't be like Saul and be bad, be good. Um, so you guys are pushing us from mere and simple moral application of Old Testament stories to take in the bigger picture and how this is uh, fulfilled in Christ. Does that mean then that the Old Testament stories have no moral value and are not exemplary uh, and have no lesson like that anymore, Trent? No. Uh... <laughs> The, uh, so yeah, if you, if you grow up in an environment where there's a lot of that, then um, the sun comes up when you learn that Christ unites all of scripture. And uh, uh, myself included, just very excited to, to find unity in the Bible. And so there can be an, a reaction to, to some of what, maybe sort of cheap moral application that is a little nervous about that altogether. There's a book uh, I reviewed, uh, it was called Missing, Missing Jesus, and there's a little spot in there where this couple's talking about um, their daughter. I think it's some, someone being taught in a Sunday school class uh, some moral lesson from the life of David and it was horrifying to them. I thought, that's not horrifying. Uh, or David disobeyed, we shouldn't follow him. And where he obeyed, we should. It's just our hope isn't in our obedience. Um, and so the, the, the textual ground for that would simply be, uh, you know, uh, Colossians, sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. They were an I mean, the word example is used there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, think of Hebrews and rest and... Um, Romans 15. Romans 15, yeah. These are written down for our instruction. That's right. So even this, you, you mentioned, I think, twice through the conference, uh, 2 Timothy 3, 16, where the scriptures are God-breathed, yeah. instruction, reproof, training, and righteousness. Yeah. Those are the Old Testament Devolves scriptures. moral, moral yeah. application. So you have to right read there. it right. Yeah. You have to read it right. You have to read it in light of Christ. Yeah. Um, but the Old Testament is full of useful, properly applied moral examples. Would it be useful to think of it in terms of getting to Jesus first and then in light of what Jesus has done, then it has some moral value for it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say yes, I mean, but you, you want each of the texts you're looking at, you have to be still asking how are they functioning in the larger story. So sometimes there may be uh, immediately a moral application that's there depending upon the context, right? So you're wanting the Bible to, you know, present itself and, and, and that, it's hard to make a universal rule, but you still have to be thinking through uh, you know, how is this ultimately leading us to Christ, right? So I think you have some examples in the New Testament. Uh, you mentioned Hebrews 3 and 4. Yep. Uh, the author uses the example of the nation of Israel in their disobedience of entering the promised land. So they send the 12 spies in and, and only two come back with a good report. And they're all, uh, they say, we don't want to go in. And so they never enter that land. And uh, so that serves as a warning to us that we have to act in faith and persevere. So there's a great example. We can learn from their negative example as well as positive example. Yet, the author of Hebrews also says there's a larger theological truth that's going on here. And in fact, the warning applies to the church in a more severe way because the rest that they missed was bad enough and they received judgment. 
But ultimately in the storyline, the rest that they missed points to a greater rest that now has come and there's no, if you miss that rest, you miss ultimate salvation. They were, they were just missing you know, land entrance. That's bad enough, but it pointed to a greater salvation. So you have to then see how these are put in terms of the entire canon. So you need the entire canon to always be thinking how this should be applied, right? Uh, think of uh, David and Bathsheba, right? Um, certainly you better learn from that. Uh, uh, Adultery is bad, right? Uh, if you don't learn that, you really haven't read the story very well. Yet it's functioning to show you all of these promises to the Davidic king. He's not the one. So there is the larger lesson that's being learned. At the same time, you have in the narrative, look what happens when adultery takes place, you can probably expect that in your life too. It's gonna to go to disaster, right? So there's, you, know, you have to do a number of, of, of levels, but you're wanting to see first how it's functioning in the larger um, message and how it's tracking, then the application. So you obviously want application. Uh, you just don't wanna be missing the main point as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's interesting that David's fall with Bathsheba in Solomon's downward spiral uh, come right after the high points. Yeah. So you come to this almost climactic moment of, oh, this could be the one, and then you turn the page, and well, it's not yet the yeah. one. Yeah. Um, well, you think of, uh, you know, thinking of, of often we uh, look at Malachi, for instance, right? So Malachi is speaking after the exile, the nation comes back, and, you know, we draw all kinds of lessons about, you know, robbing God and tithing and the priests and all those things may be legitimate but I think the point of Malachi is is that even though you get the nation of Israel back in the land they've rebuilt their temple there's still a deeper problem right mm -hmm. and that deeper problem is what the prophets are saying there's got to be something more it's got to be this is this is not the new heavens and new earth getting back to the land it's point so if you miss that point you're really missing the point of what Malachi is actually conveying, but you're also seeing the human heart hasn't changed, we need new hearts, uh, the nation of Israel functions as all kinds of examples of human depravity, that's what we are, uh, just like what we are in Adam, and so there's all kinds, you just have to let the text uh, you know, speak on their own terms. Trent, is it possible to uh, see Jesus too much in the Old Testament? Is, is he on every page? Is he in every nook and cranny? Yeah. What's the danger there? Yeah, so the answer is yes. It's possible to see him in places where he isn't. And so I think seeing Jesus on every page isn't bad language to use, as long as we know what we mean by it. If we're, if we're not careful, we can, as preachers, teach people that they're supposed to like read their chapter of Bible today and have some kind of really clear thing thing to believe or say or uh, about Jesus. So they're kind of looking around uh, for something. Whereas we, we should think of the Bible, he's used mystery novel language, you think of a movie with scenes, you know, every scene contributes to the whole. And there's stuff, there's breadcrumbs being dropped. Sometimes you just got to keep reading, it starts to add up, and there's momentum, and then things unlock later. There's an investment of time that's given. So patience to see Jesus, yes. Every book in the Bible and every chapter of every book and every word and sentence in every chapter of every book contributes to the whole. Just like every chapter and sentence of a novel contributes to the whole. And yet think of how we read novels. We're patient. We start and we read and we let it unfold itself. And we expect because it has an author who knows what they're doing and they got published that they're taking us somewhere and that things will become clear over time. So I think... We should be eager to see Jesus in the Bible and patient so that we know that we're seeing him right. So a way to, a way to talk instead of Jesus on every page, I like to talk in this little article inside your booklet about seeing Jesus from every page. So think of this. You're reading, you're reading a passage of scripture and you believe that this passage has a relationship to Jesus and you're looking at Jesus. His cross is up here. There's the, if you will, the final horizon we talked about. His cross is up here, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his current reign, his return, his intercession for us, all of this. And this passage has a relationship to Christ and his coming and his work. So what is it? Now, if I'm thinking in terms of Jesus on the page, I might be tempted to find something 
that isn't there. In short circuit, what patient work and patient reading would, would yield with time. Some thoughts? Hmm. Great. All right, one more question before we play another game. <laughs> uh, so this question, just brainstorm. You guys out loud just sort of throw some things on the table, not necessarily in sentence form, just bullet points. <laughs> but what are, what are some of the big themes and threads to watch for in the Bible? Oh. Uh, I think you used the phrase tectonic plates. So what are tectonic plates? What are Covenant's been a big one. I'll, I'll throw that one out first. Covenant. Yep, yep, yep. What else? So I'll, I'll, can I insert something real quick here? Sure. So tectonic plates we would see as the covenants, the way we're talking. Okay. And then you've got rivers that run along the top. Those would be patterns or types. So we've talked about, uh, you may have mentioned, covenant is the backbone of Scripture. Or covenant is like railroad tracks across the country and train cars that run back and forth. So in some, some literature I've seen, they like collect types or patterns and themes, and then covenant is tucked in there as one of ten. We like to think of covenants as the substructure, the tectonic plates, on top of which there are all kinds of features. Okay, so give us some sense. rivers, some yep. bushes, some right turns. Yep, the priesthood. The priesthood. priesthood. Yeah, prophet, priest, king, rest, temple, land. Yep. Marriage. Um, marriage. Yeah. Image, sonship. Sacrifice, uh, substitution, I mean, all of these themes, then they get tied into priesthood. And, so um, each one of these is big enough that when I come to it in my Bible reading, I should be thinking of maybe how it started and where it's going at the good. end. Is that fair? It's fair. Yeah. I mean, first, you know, in the immediate context to make sure you're not just reading something in there, but if it's legitimately placed, it, it could tie into a larger structure that's working across the covenants. And then you're also looking to see if later scripture is picking that up, I think, is, is, is well. Is that, that's, that's a rule that I usually follow, and usually in the Old Testament. So is this, is this getting developed, right? So you think of, uh, you know, 2 Samuel 7, a, a David is described as having, you know, I'm going to give you a name and a kingdom and all those kind of things. Well, those are all picking up Abrahamic uh, sort of allusions back. So you say, well, okay, there's, there's a legitimate textual connection that's here, right? So you're not just wanting to read in things, you're wanting to see that it is connected, how it's working in the story, but then tracking those things out. Right. Okay. Yeah, Great. city, Jerusalem, you know, those things. And some of them are connected, so Eden, God's presence, land, even the temple at the heart of the land in Jerusalem, and the Holy of Holies where God's presence is. These kinds of, that's some of these ends. themes, that's where it ends, yeah. So, so a theme moves across, and you may have multiple themes, but actually they're, relate, they're, all, they're all threaded together right. across yeah. time. So presence of God would be a big one hmm. that collects multiple themes across the story. All right, here's a game. We're gonna play Bible roulette. I'm gonna open my Bible, and you guys just oh, situate no, us okay. where we are in the Bible, and what are some themes we should be aware of? Okay. They didn't know I was going to do this. <laughs> uh, so 2 Samuel 1, um, Saul just died and David mourns. So what are the issues here? Where, where am I in God's plan? And so situate us, themes to watch for. With Russian roulette, or with uh, Bible roulette, rather. <laughs> Well, I mean, uh, it's going to yeah. be better or worse depending on how. I mean, it's clearly, done. So yeah. We'll, I mean, we'll see. I mean, you've dealt with it, some of the uh, the Davidic covenant, right? I mean, there in the in the storyline, I mean, you are uh, seeing the coming of a king, right? So it's already been anticipated way back, <laughs> all the way back to I think Adam, uh, Genesis uh, 17, Genesis 49, Numbers, Deuteronomy 17, the Book of Judges, needs a king. So Samuel now, as you have this foil. Uh, between the people's king, which is Saul, and you have David, God's king, right? And that's how it's now setting you up for the Davidic covenant, which you'll see uh, later. But it's, Saul is presented as a, a real person, a tragic figure. Uh, he's the people's king. He's like the nations. He's a Benjamite. He shouldn't even be on the throne. <laughs> uh, but David is the one. And you see then David as, a, in there, mourning over the king, 
uh, a man after God's own heart, reflecting what a true king should look like. And so, I mean, there's where it's coming in the story and so on. And we're anticipating his yeah, yeah, rise. Yeah, anticipating his throne. rise in the covenant. But he's, he's clearly being set up here from, uh, you know, from Joshua to Judges and so on, the rise of the king, right? The coming of the king. Okay, yeah. another one. Yeah. Book of Nehemiah. Where am I? What do I look for? Yeah, I haven't worked through Nehemiah carefully, but it's a prophet. You can pass the potato if you want to. Okay, you can do it. Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, Nehemiah, um, clearly you're you're dealing now, uh, it's all post-Davidic, so in terms of covenantal location, uh, it's post-Davidic, it's uh, it's now tied to the prophetic era, it's speaking of the God keeping his promises, returning back after, after exile. the Babylonian exile. Crucial, right? I mean, God has promised to bring them back. He's promised that in Jeremiah, 70 years. So, so you have in there the keeping of God's promises, yet right, Nehemiah is just not your book for a building program, right? Uh, mm-hmm. Nehemiah is telling you God is keeping his promises. He's bringing them back. But there's nothing but trouble, trouble, trouble. So God has kept his promises, yet there's still going to be more to come, right? If this is all that you have, life back in the land, uh, this is not the new heavens and earth. This is not what the prophets are envisioning in terms of the coming of the kingdom, salvation, judgment, all that. So Nehemiah is, in some sense, uh, you've, you've got the people back. It's very similar to, to Isaiah. So Isaiah is saying, Cyrus, you know, there's, God's going to raise up this servant. He's going to bring them back. But, you know, uh, Peter Gentry, my colleague, says, uh, you, can, you can take the people out of Babylon, <laughs> but you can't get Babylon out of the people. Right? Even though they're back in the land, they're still rebels, right? And so God's going to have to... So that's where Nehemiah is functioning. Same with Ezra as well. And it's crucial to see that, which really, you know, as you preach it, you're, you're setting it in terms of God's faithfulness, His promises, but there's more to come. Right? All right, one more. Joshua 1. Yeah. Trent. Okay. Okay, so Moses has just died. Moses... Uh, the covenant with Israel established through Moses at Sinai is in play. So you're, you're post-Adam, post-Noah. Um, Abrahamic promises are in, in effect, and the Mosaic covenant, or the, the, the covenant with Israel, is structuring the life of the nation, and they're moving into the land. Moses couldn't go into the land, he dies, and the, the, the baton is passed to Joshua. So Joshua's going to lead the people in. In Joshua chapter 1, Joshua is given a charge. He's given a charge to be strong and courageous, a, fam- a familiar uh, kind of a, you know, entryway to your home uh, verse, you know, the kitchen calendar verse. Be strong and courageous. He's to, he's to lead the people into the land. And how that goes is going to hang on his obedience to the word of the Lord. He's to keep the word, <laughs> obey the word. And, um, and so... Uh, as an example, when you get to, uh, you cross the river, and you're at you're Jericho, you know, how do they win there? Well, the whole way that thing goes down is intended to communicate to them that it is God who will save, and they must trust in him. And so they circle the place. Inside, they're melting with fear because they have heard about the God of Israel in the Exodus. Rahab, of course, believes that this is the one true God and um, submits herself to him and she's saved. But the walls come down. Who takes the walls down? Lord takes the walls down. They have trusted. They have trusted God's word. Joshua has entrusted God's word. But later, uh, uh, Achan's sin. Achan will, what? He keeps some stuff, right? Uh, and, um, and there's trouble and they lose the battle and people die. What happened? There was sin in the camp. They deal with it. Uh, they learn a lesson, and AI is next, and it's a great victory. So throughout Joshua, you're going to see obedience and victory in tight correspondence. That's exactly what's going on in the Mosaic Covenant, where you have ob- blessing for obedience and cursing for disobedience. Bless- so you want to be very careful not to draw a straight line between Joshua 1 and you, because you aren't under the Mosaic Covenant. And yes, God will bring you success as you obey, in a sense, because as you obey him, you're... 
You're living in the world in a wise way and in, in, in a way that matches the world. But actually, in New Covenant Christianity, often obedience leads to, uh, leads to harm and to suffering. So there's not a straight line from Joshua 1 to you, but there is a line from Joshua to Jesus, the new Joshua, who obeys perfectly. And guess what? He brings victory too. And what you saw in the book of Joshua in the victories over the Canaanites is merely, if you will, typological. It's a pattern for the victory that Jesus will bring through his cross and his resurrection over the spiritual powers and forces and devil himself puts it all under his feet. And that will be consummated in the new creation. Jesus comes back, everything will be under our feet. So that's how you move from Joshua, Abrahamic, Mosaic, pre-Davidic, pre-New Covenant to us. You've got to move through the covenants to us. I'm glad you passed on Nehemiah. That one was good. Good. <laughs> do, uh, do you have a study guide on Joshua that you recommend? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, um, I was able to write uh, a study for that was Joshua. That a softball question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, Joshua, thank you, Ryan. Uh, I was able to write a study on Joshua for Crossway you know, a few years ago. Um, it slowed this project down a little bit. And uh, that's available from Crossway. Okay. Uh, let's get this out of the way. So this should be a pretty quick answer. But does God save in different ways, Steve, in different eras? No. So what's the difference? Well, I mean, it's always uh, right across the Bible that so God saves um, by grace, uh, his initiative, his provision, uh, but through faith in the promises of God, right? And those promises are always given to us uh, tied to his provision, tied to his promises, tied to the covenant, you know, the covenant pres- uh, position. So it's, it's, it's by grace through faith, but it's always tied to his initiative, his provision, right? Now, in the Old Testament, uh, it looks forward, right? I mean, Abraham believes the promises of God. He's declared just. What's he believing? Well, he's believing that uh, all the promises tied to the Abrahamic covenant that will eventually lead to the coming of a greater provision, whether he knows all of what's going to come, it's the same object of faith, namely uh, the, the promises of God centered in his provision, which for us is the same. Now we know more clearly it's Christ alone. The grounding to it in, in, in the Old Testament in terms of where is the actual full atonement uh, is points beyond itself. God is forgiving them. He is justifying them. But this is what Paul wrestles with in Romans 3, right? Uh, In some sense, how is God just? He's passed over the sins beforehand, but that can't last forever. So they are looking to what God will do, his promises. In the Old Covenant, they are the same way. They, They may be offering in obedience their sacrifice, but they are to be trusting that God will save, that it's by grace through faith in the promises of God. Okay, so what is the difference then between... What changes from the last book of the Old Testament to, let's say, the middle of the book of Acts? Uh, And this could be another one of those brainstorm bullet point, let's just throw ideas on the table kind of questions, Um, not not paragraphs. What changes? Spirit? Spirit has come. Well, yeah, the the completion of what uh, God has promised has now come in Christ. Full, Full atonement is there that was anticipated in the old, but is now here. The new people is established. The wall is broken right. down between Jew, Jew and Gentile. Gentile. There's together. one new humanity, yeah. the church. You mentioned spirit. Anything to add to that? The, the spirit was in the Old Testament, yep. right? So yeah, yeah. I mean, you have to be yeah, very careful. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have been there from all eternity throughout the Old Testament. It becomes more clear as to uh, the person distinctions of Son and Spirit and, and Father, Son, and Spirit. Uh, yet we have the Spirit's active role in creation, we empowering leaders and so on. The prophets uniquely anticipate a unique work of the Spirit tied to Messiah and his people. So I, I myself would say that uh, the major difference is that um, we do have the Spirit's work in the Old Testament, even in people, bringing them to new life. But the difference would be that under the previous covenants, not everybody in those covenants there by very nature. Some are born, uh, some are true Christians or are believers, um, uh, others are not, right? So you have Israel within Israel. You have Abraham's offspring that there's an Isaac versus an Ishmael. And there's no evidence that Ishmael is a, is a converted uh, believing individual. Uh, so that what's true under the giving of the spirit, the spirit is now poured out not just upon leadership 
or among a few, but the entire people of God are gifted by the Spirit and born of the Spirit. So you have gifting that is not as much in the Old Testament upon everybody. It's prophet, priest, kings, key people, Bezalel and craftsmen and so on. Uh, and it's not the entire community that's born of the Spirit. That, I think, is a major difference. And it's an here. unchanging gift That's right, of the that's unchanging. Now, right? So yeah. there's where you see the fullness that now has come. So you do have Old Testament saints, believing people. Uh, David, you know, and he's a king, so he's anointed in a unique way. Yet uh, you, you have the Elizabeths and Zacharias of uh, the Simeons and Annas. We see them in the New Testament, but they're Old Testament people. True believers looking for the hope and promises. Uh, yet that was not true of the entire nation of Israel. Okay. Good. Anything else we want to say about the newness of the new covenant or what changed or I'd yes just, yeah. I'd add um, so Jeremiah 31 everyone will know the Lord you're not going to have to tell each other to know the Lord so the new covenant community this Jew and Gentile church uh, is a regenerate community it's everyone in the church everyone in this community knows the Lord whereas under the old covenant you had uh, you were you're born into it circumcision and you may know the Lord or not not all Jews were true Jews what about laws? In terms food, of food laws? Well, I mean, you have to look at uh, the food laws under the covenant that it's under, right? So for the nation of Israel, those food laws are given uh, primarily in the old covenant. They are to be obeyed for the nation of Israel under that covenant, right? As, those, as that covenant comes to its fulfillment, uh, as it now leads to the coming of Christ, that covenant obligation we are no longer under. So we're no longer under the law as a covenant. We're not where Israel was under that. Now, uh, that doesn't mean that um, uh, there's not things from that covenant, teaching, instruction, moral obligation, that isn't picked up and applied in the new covenant. So we have to then, we can't just go to the old covenant and say, oh, this comes over. We have to say, no, we're not under it, and then we have to think through how across the canon it reaches its fulfillment in Christ. So food laws, for instance, uh, are clearly done away with uh, as a covenant obligation, right? Uh, so that uh, Acts 10, um, Mark 7, I mean, they're food laws. I mean, he makes all things clean. All th and we know the purpose of those food laws served a certain purpose for the nation of Israel at that time, which is now done, right? Uh, you then have to think through other obligations as well. So some of the what we call moral commands, I mean, there's issues tied to uh, obedience and love of God and neighbor and uh, not committing adultery. I mean, those things do tie to, ultimately, I think, God's uh, demand of creatures. Uh, uh, and they're picked up in the new covenant and applied to us. So we have to keep working through the lens of what the new covenant brings, what Christ has brought the whole Bible has to serve for us as instruction. Similar question, but what about covenants then? Are the Old Testament covenants still in effect? If so, which ones? Why? How does it relate to the New Covenant? Um, so all of the covenants have a relationship to one another. There's a certain way that they interlock and lead to one another. And they all have a particular relationship with the new covenant, who, which fulfills them. So what was expected of Adam, what Adam was created for, to image God, to spread God's image and his glory throughout the whole world, is now possible and happening in the new covenant community. Um, the Noahic covenant, God promised that seed time and harvest would continue. He's not going to wipe out the human race. He's going to bring about his purposes for humanity in the context of a fallen world without keeping reset like he did with the flood. So that's still in effect, actually. The Abrahamic covenant, God's promises to Abraham are fulfilled in the new covenant and being experienced by the church and will culminate in the, the new creation. The Mosaic covenant... Um, you know, has certain purposes more temporal. It, it's a teacher. It's meant to, um, Israel is a vehicle for the Messiah who will come. And the Mosaic Covenant in its structures and types and instructions is preparing us for the Messiah. But it is obsolete. It's the language of Hebrews. When I first saw that and realized, like, it, obsolete uh, with the coming of Christ. The Davidic Covenant, I mean, Jesus is on his throne right now, reigning. 
So each of the covenants has a different relationship to the new, but they are all fulfilled in the new. The new brings about either the, the conclusion of the, of the Mosaic, the, the Israel covenant, or it fulfills its part, the covenant's purposes, as in the case of Adam yeah. or, or uh, Abrahamic. How's that? How would you do it? Uh, I would say, yeah, yeah, I think it's very similar. I would say that uh, the Noahic tied to creation, uh, you know, Noah is tied uniquely to the universal aspect tied to creation order. Uh, that continues to the end of the age. The unique uh, promise through Abraham, Israel, through the seed, through David, all of those covenants have been fulfilled, and fulfillment language uh, means that that to which they point has now come. The new covenant has dawned. Uh, there's still the future consummation of the new covenant with the second coming of Christ, but the Abrahamic covenant has been brought to pass in him, the establishment of the church, there will be the consummation of it, but I would not say we're, the, the Abrahamic covenant is still going, it's reached its terminus now in Christ. Uh, the old covenant, the same way, Paul's very, very clear about that in, in Galatians, but you can still say that even though it's ended, it's still pointed forward to, and now that it's come, we are no longer under it as a covenant obligation. In the same way with the Davidic. They've all reached their goal, fulfillment in Christ. But the creation order, Christ is last Adam. He will bring the new creation. Yet there's an overlap of creation order this age in still sin and death. And this is what we struggle with as, as believers. There's still a fallen world around us. Yet uh, the, the future age that the prophets look forward to, the dawning of the kingdom, is here. Yet we still pray, your kingdom come. The spirit is here as first fruits, yet we still wait for the fullness of the spirit. We have eternal life, yet we will have eternal life. So that's called famously the already not yet. There's an overlap of the ages. So creation structures, marriage will continue until the end. Yet when Christ comes again, it'll be done away with, right? Uh, it'll give way to uh, fully Christ and his bride. Uh, so I think that's how these covenants are leading. Christ fulfills the Noahic ultimately in terms of he brings the new creation. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Mm. So there's no sense in which the Abrahamic covenant is still being worked out? Well, it's being worked out, but okay. it's being worked out, I, I say, in the new covenant. Yeah. I, Already not uh, yet. Be, the With seed the of, you think of, think of Galatians, I mean, the seed of the, the Abrahamic seed ultimately is Christ. We are Abraham's children, so it's, it's being worked out through Christ to his church. Got it. Um, Good stuff. Uh, if Gentile Christians can now be sons of Abraham through faith, then what does that mean for ethnic Jews? Um, what's their relationship to Father Abraham? What's their relationship to Old Testament promises? Right. Yeah, yeah, if you want to. I can start us, sure. Yeah. Um, so Ephesians chapter 2 and Galatians 3 were just huge for me in locking this in. Namely, that there's one people of God, the church, Jew and Gentile. Across history, there's Israel. We talked about Abraham's different children. Um, but the people to which those former promises pointed was this new covenant community which is created, which is not unrelated to Israel. Jesus was the true Israelite who obeyed perfectly the son of Abraham, the son of David, and as we're united to him by faith, we're children of Abraham. So uh, one people of God, Jew and Gentile. So what about ethnic, ethnic Jews? Some would say, God made promises to Abraham and his children, therefore, and concerning land and descendants, therefore, and, a, and a king and a throne, therefore there must be a king and a throne in the land in the way that it sounded on the page. But as you watch the story unfold and the way the prophets understand where all this was going and even the way the New Testament authors read it. These things are clearly going global and they're going, so Paul speaks about a mystery that is now revealed. The mystery in the Old Testament is how all these things are coming about. Lots of question marks, lots of tension, lots of promises. In the New Testament, the tension is released with the coming of Christ and the creation of the church, Jew and Gentile. That's it. That's it. You think of the end of Amos, God promises that the, the booth of David, the tent of David will be restored. Uh, Israel will flourish. And there's, a, there's, a, there's like a pic, almost a picture of a new creation. And in the Jerusalem council in Acts 15, they're going to say that's fulfilled here in the coming, uh, in the salvation of Gentiles. Because the, the Edom was included in Amos 9 there. 
So one people of God, that's the point, Jew and Gentile. So what about ethnic Jews? I think Romans 11 will tell us that in the future, this is my take, that there would be uh, some future great engrafting of ethnic, eth- eth- ethnic descent Jews into the one people of God, the church. That, that to me is not in conflict yeah, with yeah. this one people of God. Yeah, understand. I mean, you know, a lot of the difference is uh, those who hold out still uh, specific promises for ethnic national Israel will say that, yes, they'll, I mean, Ms. Christ has brought that about, but there's something distinct that is not yet uh, being realized, distinct from Gentile believers. The problem with that is, as you walk through the covenants, Christ is last Adam, true Israel, Davidic king. He's bringing all of this, so Israel functions not only as a people, but pointing forward to him, and he now establishes a church that's international. Jew and Gentile. So whether there are Gentiles or ethnic national Jews, they will all come to Christ, right? And so I do think Romans 11 does hold out a great ingathering of many, many Jewish people. God's not finished with the Jewish people, but he will bring them to faith in Messiah into his people, which is now uh, to all nations. I don't see any kind of now distinct, outstanding difference or promise that is not found in Christ to his church that is now just given to ethnic national Israel. Uh, Many, many people do. Uh, I just don't see how that's going to make sense of Christ bringing these things to pass to his people uh, in an Ephesians 2 sense. And yet some of our friends would say all Israel will be saved in Romans 11 is accomplished in the Gentiles being saved. Right, that is one interpretation, right, that there right, may not necessarily right, be right, some right. grand That's right. there's, there's, of ethnic... There's, a number, of, there's right. a number of interpretations of Romans 9 to 11. Yeah. One is a more dispensational interpretation that there will be, this will be where ethnic national Israel receives all of her promises, and we've said, we just don't see the Bible working that way. There is a great future for ethnic Jews in Christ in the church. Uh, others will say, throughout this whole period of first to second coming, of Christ is that the true Israel is the church and that's you know that's being gathered in now right not a future revival or a great in gathering and others will say no no there's a great in gathering the last two views will still say it's brought into the church yeah yeah so we have just a few minutes left and I want to do this because I can imagine someone thinking uh, okay I want to read my Bible better um, but I I don't know how to do it. I mean, it's one thing to sit over Philippians 4 and read it a bunch of times and to notice, you know, the repetition of the word joy or something, but this is a whole lot of material. You're talking connections that span thousands of years and thousands of pages in my Bible, Um, and so we want to be sympathetic to that. What resources besides your sold-out book, uh, (laughs) enjoy it right now, what resources besides your great book, which uh, I really do recommend, and I uh, think it would be probably the best window or, or entry into this discussion, but other resources that you guys want to recommend that people might want to jot down um, that would help them read the Bible more holistically and yeah. Christ-centeredly? Yeah. Um, yeah, so as a pastor, there are a few resources that I'm using. Uh, Tom Schreiner has a really helpful whole Bible theology. It's a great reference. He'll do a, you know, a 10-page summary, a biblical theological summary of a book of the Bible. The it King helps. and His Beauty? The King and His King Beauty, and his it's beauty. called. Yeah, it's a great book. Schreiner, Paul, The King and His Beauty. Yeah. Paul House has an Old Testament theology where he'll, if you're preparing to teach on a book or you really want to get it, he'll do a good job of walking through an Old Testament book from one side to the other and hitting pause and doing what he calls canonical synthesis. He's like trying to show you how it all fits together. That's a helpful book. Um, I found also, this would be more like for everybody, maybe you're not teaching, but Don Carson's For the Love of God two volume series, uh, it supplements a Bible reading plan. And so you can be reading across the Bible through the year and then per day he knows where you're at and he's gonna write a single page at one of those chapters, and maybe holding two of those chapters together. I always like to see what Dr. Carson did in the space of a page on that chapter. Uh, he usually cuts to the chase, to the points, pastoral. It's 
appropriately exegetical and technical, but it's understandable. Two-volume series, For the Love of God by Don Carson, is a great reference to this kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, uh, Graham Goldsworthy, Australian, uh, who puts together the Bible, so according to plan, uh, he has other books, Kingdom, uh, Gospel and Kingdom. Uh, there's a shortened version of it, Vaughn Roberts, right. uh, British pastor, God's Big Picture. Uh, those are all helpful. Uh, you know, as you read those books, uh, my older brother, who was uh, instrumental in helping me in my early Christian life, used to always say to me, read the Bible first. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Keep reading scripture. So all these books are helps. They help put things together. They, you know, even uh, hopefully our book here will just put things in such a way that you say, oh, yes, let me look at seeing if that's how the Bible reads, but read the Bible over and over and over again, right? Yeah, cool. uh, when you read a, when you watch a good movie or read a mystery novel, um, you know, you get the main points. You know, we all know the main point is salvation in Christ alone. Uh, when you go back and read it again, or you watch a good movie, you say, I missed that. Uh, there's, oh, that, that, I, that guy showed up there, and I missed that, and now I see it again, because you went back over it again, right? And the more you go reading, so I mean, we really, really need to be committed minimally to reading the Bible through once a year. I mean, minimally, right? So you're just constantly back and reading over and over again. And then with these books, they help then give you some categories to say, yes, that's true to the Bible. But once you get little red flags come up, that pay attention to that, right? The scripture is your authority. So is it possibly true that um, we have too high expectations or we want too quick of results? Uh, we want to be able to make these connections tomorrow or even a year from now. And it's okay to just be reading our Bibles, reading our Bibles and growing in our familiarity and uh, Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, yep. I've heard someone say before that the more you read the Bible, the deeper it gets and the smaller it feels. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm, yeah. I've yeah. been a Christian yeah. long enough to yeah. experience that. Yeah. And I'd add, um, there are certain books you can read that'll help you. It's the Gospel of Matthew. That was your advice to me when I moved here. You should just keep reading the Gospel of Matthew. It's on my way out a little Well, bit. because it uses the Old Testament yeah, so much, yeah, yeah. or it's Hebrews, or so on, right? Romans, yeah. and then Hebrews. So Hebrews is actually like a what a 16 chapter sermon on the Old Testament so so that and then secondly uh, keep going to church because mm -hmm. a, a, a maybe the like not everyone had a copy of the scriptures right that's a privilege that we have but the way that God gets his word into you is through it preached and taught and he has actually structured his plan so that his church is fed and strengthened through the teaching and preaching ministry of the word so support that teaching and pre preaching ministry. Read the text before Sunday. Show up ready to hear and soak it in. And over time, things come together. Yeah, and it's crucial. I mean, this is not a knock on um, daily bread or anything like that. Uh, but the tendency is, is you read just a verse out of context, right? So even as you approach uh, the Bible, so you're reading uh, Isaiah, it is a whole book. So you have to then ask yourself as I'm reading that, What's the whole message of this, this uh, prophecy here? Uh, when you read the Pentateuch, what's the whole message of Genesis to Deuteronomy? It's a whole book. It's not meant to be read. Uh, you eventually have to read it in sections, but it's given to you as a unit, right? That also helps you see then the connection. So you're not just reading just isolated chapters, right? Why is this here? How does this contribute? And then there's all kinds of helps, right? God has given us. We don't read just by ourselves, you know, hidden away on an island, right? I mean, that's what the church is for, right? And the church, through the ages, and currently we're here, uh, and God has gifted the church with books and literature. We stand on the shoulders of others, and we, but we always bring it back to Scripture itself. Some of the most helpful books are the kids' books. Yeah. So <laughs> got the, the Big Picture Story Bible by Dave Helm. You got a munchkin? You don't have a munchkin. Get the book. <laughs> Work through the book. Yeah. And what, what, what children's books do, and a good author, uh, is have to synthesize things and boil it down. So you can see the Bible story from good altitude. New Growth Press has a book called um, The Gospel Story Bible. A little more in-depth, maybe for a 9, 10-year-old, than the Big Picture Story Bible, maybe for a 3 to 6-year-old, I'm thinking. So just keep an eye out for the good books. Ask your pastor what books you recommend for kids. Tell the story of the Bible. Those can be helpful. They're all supplemental, and they're not actually Bibles, by the way. 
Yeah. You know, they're called story Bibles. Great. That just helps. Hmm. Thank you so much, Trent. Of course. Steve, we so appreciate you guys being with us this weekend. We'll let them Thank take you. a seat. Thank you. Yep. And we have a yearly tradition here at Claris, ending our Saturday night with prayer. Uh, we usually have uh, one of our pastors connected with uh, our Gospel Coalition Regional Chapter. Um, Michael Kelshaw is the pastor of Trinity at the Marketplace here in town, and a dear friend and uh, pastoral comrade with me, and uh, so thankful for his ministry. So we're going to have him close us in prayer, and then you'll be dismissed. We'll either see you tomorrow morning, or we'll see you next year, Lord willing. Michael, go ahead. Let's pray together. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, living God, we praise you and we thank you that you are God and that there is no other. Uh, We thank you that there is none like you. We thank you so much for your word, your love letter to us. Uh, We love your book, and uh, we praise you and thank you so much for Jesus, and we thank you that Jesus is the key that unlocks the Bible. And we uh, praise you and thank you for your uh, saving grace in him, the great salvation that you've given to us in Jesus. Uh, We thank you for the time that you've given us to think Uh, deeply about how the Bible fits together. We thank you so much for these dear brothers who have served us so well this weekend Uh, in faithfully teaching your word. We uh, praise you and we thank you for them. Uh, We pray for them both uh, that they would enjoy their walk with you and that they would continue to do the work that you have given them to do. Uh, Father, as we go now, we do pray Uh, that you would help us to uh, think through these things more. We pray that you would help us to read the Bible better. Uh, And as we do, by your grace, we pray that we would rejoice uh, all the more in your redeeming and reconciling grace. And that by your grace, we would love you uh, more deeply Uh, We would worship you in all of life. We would enjoy you now and forever. And we pray it all for your great glory and our joy in Jesus' name. Amen.